Light waves, that's what it works through. It's been discovered now, and in fact, just during the last few weeks, um, it, it's been discovered that even the particles that we're looking at, which are these monatomic gold clusters, when you get down to their atoms, even the atoms now aren't solid. They are not physical property, they are a gaseous substance. So it's no wonder they will levitate and, 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 and whatever, you know, there's nothing to them. But cooling will make them heavy. Two superconductors can be linked together. You, you, can, you can trigger one in, oh, down here in LA, and you, you can decide to send electricity to Chicago. All you have to do is the resonance frequency, the two of them together, just to get them in tune, like a couple of tuning forks or whatever. And you turn it off, and you can go away for 100 years and come back, and it'll still be flowing until you decide to turn off that, that triggering mechanism. So Hudson got very, very, very excited about all this, and he went along uh, to the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, and he, he met with the director there, a fellow called Hal Puthoff, who many of you might know or know of. And Hal Puthoff is, is famous for his studies of zero-point gravity and vacuum energy, that, that sort of thing. What Puthoff had established, he'd been working on gravity calculations by the Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov from the 60s and he'd been working out the mathematics for this and he'd worked out that that matter was capable of resonating in different dimensions that, that weren't ours but what he calculated mathematically from Sakharov's work was that the moment it begins to do that at that moment the moment you know it's on the change just hooking into the beginnings of another dimension it will automatically lose four ninths of its weight and Hudson went along, he said, look, this is really interesting because 44% mine's losing and that's the same, it's the same figure, four ninths. And so um, they agreed, well, yeah, I mean, it's because you're now, this stuff is beginning to resonate in another dimension. That's what's happening to it. It should disappear totally, he was told, if it carries on, and he said, it does. It disappears totally. We don't know where it goes, it just disappears. So they decided to test this. And uh, they said that look, the way to do it is this, if you have a, a, a little pile of powder in a pan and it becomes invisible, that means it's still there but you can't see it. So if you've got a spatula and messed it up in the pan, it would come back, when it comes back, in a mess. Um, but we suspect that yours won't. We suspect it will come back in the same shape that it disappeared in. And that's exactly what happened. It didn't come back in a mess. It came back looking exactly like it had disappeared in that same perfect shape. There you are, they said, it's not invisible. It has simply moved out of our space-time and it's now been brought back into it. Well, from that moment in time and around that moment in time, scientists all over the world were talking about these hyperdimensions. Um, Britain's Stephen Hawking, the famous Cambridge professor, um, Sir Martin Rees, our astrologer royal over there, it took a lot of people by surprise, really. They, they were saying that, that there are realms that exist around us and within our environment that we know nothing about. They called them hypersystems. They didn't know how to explain them, and they were coming up with drawings of this sort, trying to explain these sort of parallel situations, but it, it didn't really work. It, it, such pictures didn't prove anything. It was demonstrated that the concept of another dimension was demonstrated by cubist art, of all things. Cubist art was based on a principle of showing the dimensions that we can't see. And this, they, they had this wonderful thing which they called the Great Prismosaurus. Now, the Great Prismosaurus has, is, a, is a, a, an article with millions of facets on it, but it actually has a fourth dimension for everything. Everything that you can see the outside of, you can also see the inside of. What are these um, dimensions? Well, Martin Rees explains that, that our dimension it is called three-dimensional because it goes up or down or left to right or backwards and forwards. We have no objective perception of it. We just live within this realm. There are other universes, they say. Some are crumbled up, so small that, that, that we can't even imagine them, but they're accessible. Um, others, they say, are a millimeter away from us. It's the world where Einstein's theory of then, now, and the future, all coming into play at once. It's looking at the 30-storey building from outside as against being in it on its 15th floor. On the 15th floor, you perceive the 15th floor. You can look out of the window and know that you're part of something bigger, but you can't see the other floors. 
Well, the other dimensions are, in fact, those other floors. You can move into them. You can travel up and you can travel down, but you have to know how. You have to know how to trigger it. They say that gravity, they now understand, gravity is actually a signal leaking out of one of these other dimensions into ours. It, that's where they say the power of gravity comes from. So we're in this bubble, they say. Our whole universe is a bubble wrapped inside other bubbles that are wrapped inside other bubbles. People like NASA come on the scene and they say, yeah, well, it, it will be very easy. You know, we can move things between dimensions. We're not actually doing it yet, but we know how to do it uh, because it's really a matter of, of resonance frequencies. All you have to do is to tune the locations to each other, just like setting up your radio onto a station. You know, when you get it in the right place, the message comes through. Treat it like tuning forks. Set up the vibrations between them. That way, we can send anything we want, they say. We can send pictures, we can send text, we can send physical matter. What we've seen over the past six or seven years now is an increasing awareness in the science press of the DNA links with these materials and how important they're becoming. They've talked about how they can be used to re-coordinate um, the uncontrolled division of body cells. This particular article here from Scientific American, the way it reads is, is this, that they place these, these elements at the end of the strands. The researchers examined the electrical properties of short lengths of double helix DNA in which there was a ruthenium atom at each end of one of the strands. Mead and Kayam, the scientists estimated from earlier studies that a short single strand of DNA ought to conduct up to a hundred electrons a second. Imagine their astonishment when they measured the flow along the ruthenium-doped double helix to find that the current was up by a factor of more than 10,000 times. It was as if, they said, the double helix was behaving like a piece of molecular wire. Wow. It's our monatomic gold wires. They're able to turn the DNA into becoming a part of its structure, or vice versa. The two things can become one. By this means that they build up an integrated circuit of light within the body, and they have the ability to perform cell correction. DNA has memory. What does the memory do? It tells, it, it tells the DNA what it should look like. It tells the cell structure what it should be. What is cancer then? Cancer is malformed or deformed cellular structure. That's all it is. It might be horrific, but it's basically very simple. It's DNA in a muddle. How do you correct it? You make it 10,000 times more intelligent and, and the DNA says to itself, I shouldn't be like this. I'm supposed to be like this, and it changes. It will reconfigure itself correctly in accordance with the way it should be. This is cancer treatment that involves no surgery. It involves no drugs. It involves no radiation. It leaves the immune system intact. And suddenly the light of life has become a, life, a truly life-giving substance. None of it is about being anti-cancer. This is the interesting thing. And AIDS and all of these types of diseases, it's not anti-anything. It's pro-life. And the thing that, that has amazed doctors is that you can actually cure cancers by thinking about preserving life. Everything that they've done up to date has been the opposite. It's about killing cancer. And in doing that, you're destroying DNA, you're destroying body tissue, you're destroying cellular structure. You're affecting their immune system. Because the rule was that nobody said you had to have a good quality of life after the cancer had been killed. What they had to do was to kill the cancer. Well, the best cancer cure on that basis is a bullet through the head. That's killed the cancer. Well, now what, what, what they're looking at is the potential for not killing the cancer, but for giving the body back the, com the life resonances that it should have had. And now scientists are saying, yeah, the light body. All of this stuff connects together within us in light waves. We now know how to begin to manipulate those light waves.